Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. NURSA approved some hefty tariff hikes for ESCOM this week, but still not what the utility has claimed it needs. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the decision and its implications. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. What is the background to these high increases? Well, the hikes really come not unexpected because we know that we've had uh, it's an MIPD5 application which was submitted all the way back in 2021 and we knew that Eskom was asking for these very large increases. Uh, NURSA only adjudicated the first year of uh, that application uh, and gave Eskom half of what it was asking, or less than half of what Eskom was asking for, uh, less than 10% and Eskom was asking for more than 20%. So. And we also knew that the way they did that was they changed the regulatory asset base in a way that decreased the amount that they gave for depreciation. That went to court and Eskom as has become the norm won that court case and therefore we knew just on that figure alone there was going to be an increase that court uh, adjudication. Then there was also the court adjudication around uh, the 69 billion equity injection which during the MYPD4 period a uh, nurse uh, was found to have illegally taken that off Eskom's allowable revenue and there was a settlement agreement in terms of adding that back in 15 billion rand tranches so we knew that was going to be baked in and then there were some regulatory clearing account decisions. Most of the liquidation has been pushed, phased in later on so that's why we're seeing a higher, so that the first year increase is, uh, is going to be 18.65% against Eskom's request for about 32%. And then Eskom's subsequent year, so, so the next uh, next April 2024, um, that was going. They were asking for less than 10 percent, and they got more than 12 percent, and that really accounts for some of the liquidation of the RCAs that have already been approved, and there are more to come. It's not a surprise in the sense that there was quite a lot already baked in, that that uh, NURSA had no choice unless they wanted to defy the courts. Um, the, they had to give Eskom quite a large double digit sort of increase. But I think uh, it still is, I suppose, higher than I think, well, definitely the, what society was asking for. But even, I suppose, Eskom w would have been concerned because generally uh, NURSA tends to just halve what Eskom's request is. And the 18.65% is a, is a hefty hike, as, as you said. And, uh, and I think uh, it's really... Uh, an interesting dynamic, I think, that Eskom and NURSA had to walk, a very difficult corridor where they really had a lot baked in. They were trying to push back on certain components. Uh, they had some headroom to push back around IPP costs, and those have been cut massively, and that's actually bad news because those IPP costs relate to the fact that these projects that we are expecting to come into the system that were procured for the, through the government system aren't coming in. We know that there's been massive disappointment around gov the government procurement. Bid window 5 was massively delayed. Bid window 6, we hardly saw any projects passing through the gate into uh, preferred bidder status. The risk mitigation round uh, was, uh, you know, only very few projects have come through there. So there was headroom to lower the IPP costs. Um, but as I say, that's not bad, good in a, a context where we need more generation capacity. So I think while shocking <laughs> in terms of the actual number, not surprising in the end. There was particular focus ahead of the decision and during the announcement on Eskom's diesel request. Yes, Eskom, as they put in their request initially in 2021, middle of the year, uh, but only the first year was adjudicated. So then when they started to adjudicate last year, uh, the, the other two, the outer two years, so April 1 this year for the, the 24 financial year and then also the 25 financial year, they didn't change the bottom line request in terms of what they were looking for for allowable revenue, but they massively changed some of the assumptions. And one of the big assumptions to change was they said that we're going to need a load factor out of the open cycle gas turbines of 12% for the next two years. To recover the cost of doing that, they, they wanted a diesel amount of 17 billion in the first year and close to 18 billion in the second year. In the end, NURSA deliberated on that 
uh, and the reason for that is that the coal fleet energy availability factor, as we know, has dropped precipit precipitously, and it's now, you know, the coal fleet only is often below 50% at towards the end of last year, uh, and that's why we're having these very intense load shedding bouts. The overall EAF of Eskom has dropped below 60%. So the initial application was to assume the 72% EAF. And I think when they ran the numbers again, they realized there's no way we're going to get that. Therefore, we have to, to keep the lights on, we have to shift load to the, the open cycle gas turbines because we're going to only be doing 59% EAF out of the fleet. Uh, so they asked for this massive amount for diesel. In the end, NERSA de has declined that. They've given them more than they usually give, so they're giving them a load factor of six uh, percent, so half the twelve percent, which equates to nearly well eight point four billion rands worth of diesel for this coming year. But we re we already know that the Eskom's in massive backlog from this year because they've been operating from January from April to November at least they were operating an OCG fleet at a load factor of seventeen percent, <laughs> and that was during the worst ever year of load shedding because that EAF of the coal fleet kept declining. Uh, so to cover, and then in November they said, well, we've run out of budget because their budget for the year was only six billion. And then we can see the intensity of load shedding as it's jumped up. They got a little bit of re relief from Petro SA, 50 million liters, which if they'd been running it, you know, in their normal ways, they were from April to November would have been depleted in a week or less. But they've been sort of using it more selectively generally over the peak periods which is what these plants are really designed to do but you know we've been needing to use the the uh, open cycle gas turbines very intensively to r just ro lower the intensity of load shedding now that we can't we can see that it jumps up a couple of stages um, and we're currently in stage six uh, so really there was a big focus on this diesel can Eskom recover diesel through the uh, through the tariff get more diesel run the fleet as they think they're going to need it. And um, NERSA's decision is there's is a moral hazard here. It encourages inefficiencies because that's not the way you're supposed to be using the diesel. You must rather be focusing on your EAF and therefore we're not going to approve the diesel. The issue is that the likelihood is that ESCOM is going to have to run it <laughs> harder and longer uh, and they're going to run out of diesel money again in 2023-24. So they'll get through the first few months and then they'll run out of diesel. So do they then get onto the Ben Skumon and drive to the Treasury again? And we know the Treasury is rejecting that. They're pushing back hard. They don't want to give money for that already because they're looking at the, the big lopping off or switching or transferring a whole lot of Eskom debt onto the national accounts. So that diesel issue is going to come back and bite us, even though it's, I think, quite a positive outcome for Eskom overall. Uh, the fact that they didn't get that money for diesel means they, they and they're really in backlog for the for this year as we go into the new financial year I think at some point something is going to give and at the moment what gives is load shedding. The reaction to these hikes has been broadly negative. Yes that's to be expected I mean when you get um, well above inflation increases in a context where the people are struggling uh, and are really facing inflationary environments all over, um, whether it's food. Okay, we've got some fuel price relief recently, which is, is most, um, you know, it's been quite uh, important for the economy at the start of the year uh, and most welcome. But, you know, is inflation everywhere in the system? Uh, people's salaries aren't keeping up with that inflation. So you can understand that there's going to be resistance to this. and. Of course, there's the anger around Eskom generally because we load shedding so intensively. So now you want to charge me more for a product that you can't supply. That's the feeling. Plus, there's the trust deficit, and that trust deficit really relates to the years of deep corruption and state capture at Eskom, which has really got us to this point in the EAF because part of that corrupt era was about not signing the RPP procurements. And if we had just done that on a regular basis, there would have been time and space in the system to do more of the maintenance that is now required. Uh, but we didn't. We stopped from 2014. We stopped buying uh, and we only restarted. Okay, some bid window four projects started in 2018, uh, but those have been procured all the way back in 2014. And then we only really started getting our, 
our renewables, wind, windrows going more recently, and those have failed. Actually, they, they've the, the, the whole program's not going as it should. So there's no supply side relief coming. Uh, so other than diesel and the EAF, those are the only two immediate levers that we have available to us. So there's a lot of anger around load shedding, and uh, correctly so. And this will help somewhat, I think, this decision. Even though there's a lot of unhappiness about it, it does give uh, Eskom some sort of financial buffer that, uh, the, uh, uh, that they weren't probably fully expecting, so a bit of relief. Um, but it's not enough from an Eskom perspective, but from a society perspective, it's more than enough. And there's a lot of anger, and they said they sh and the, the, the public hearings were very clear, don't give Eskom anything more than inflation re-increases until they get their act together. The problem is to get your act together is you need to have that steady transition to cost-reflective tariffs. You need money in the system. You need money for maintenance. And, you know, either it comes from the consumer or it comes from the taxpayer. At the moment, it's both. You've got the consumer paying, and then you've got these regular injections into uh, Eskom from the fiscus because of this debt burden that's unsustainable and they can't fund. So once February comes and the, that is maybe transferred to um, to the National Treasury accounts, maybe then there'll be more visibility of what Eskom can really do and whether this tariff is fair. Desperate anger, great unhappiness, and it's understandable. What are the implications for load shedding? Well, for load shedding, as I say, the only two real levers are the energy availability factor of the coal fleet. Um, the nuclear fleet is off this year, or half of it for the whole year because of this long-term, well, it's not really maintenance, it's preparing it for its life extension. So really the coal fleet EAF, which, uh, as I said, has it's dipped below 50% for the first time towards the end of last year. So it's very, very bad. That's the, that's the main lever, and that's the lever that NERSA wants uh, Eskom to focus wholeheartedly. That's the lever that na the NEOCOM wants, uh, or the, through the, the Energy Action Plan, wants Eskom to focus on wholeheartedly. But it's not an easy one to get right, especially if you look at the secular trend. And then the, the trend, as they say, is your friend. And in this case, it's the enemy. The trend has been down, and it's been down for several years. It's not, and it's not something that you can easily turn. But that is going to be a big focus, I think. And uh, hopefully some of these maintenance efforts over the last few months will start coming through into a, a more stable and higher EAF. But we're not going to see the sort of 72% that uh, even the, the plus 60% is going to be tough, which is what NERSA is basically basing this decision on. And then keeping b holding back money from the diesel side means you know, Eskom's going to run out of diesel money again. And it's already run out because it's, it's going to move into the new financial year in a massive diesel backlog. As I mentioned, there's no RPP relief really coming through from the official programs. Those have, that has been quite catastrophic. But we can see some RPP relief coming through in the form of private uh, generation. We know there's this so-called pipeline of nine gigawatts of private generation that is trying to take advantage of the reforms and that will help but those will also take 18 to 24 months to come into the system and there's also been some mismanagement of the reform in that uh, it crowded out those wind projects that bid for uh, bid window six so it's a, it's a, been a very difficult period so i think th th that's why there was so much focus on the diesel because i think people realize uh, with the eif EAF going to take some time to recover, where are they going to get the money for the diesel? And they've got some money for the diesel, but it's not nearly enough uh, to really limit load shedding. So I think that we're in for another very, very tough load shedding year. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.